We did not yes, that yes. way. Karen took it upon herself to do the research and the results she's going to be presenting today. I'm just going to turn the meeting over to her. Is there anything I can do with this thing that I need to remind you? Okay. Karen, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to our lunch. So um, I'm going to do my best to multitask between reading my notes and doing this clicker. So. I'm a member of the Humble Bay Harbor Working Group. I thought it would be a good education for us all to take a look at other ports on our seascape. So can you hear me okay? Okay. Raise your hand if I start to fade. Every port I've been researching the past couple of years are moving forward in tonnage and developments. I look at our port and we're losing ground, almost becoming irrelevant. The Port of Humboldt is the state's northernmost deep water shipping port and the only one between San Francisco and Coos Bay. We all know this. Uh, while it can accommodate Panama Canal class vessels, according to Caltrans, um, it has nine deep water berths. Our port is significantly underutilized. So let's take a look at these ports, starting with Portland. Portlandia. Um, Portland, up until a few years ago, was I'll have my clicker. Uh, was a major containerized port. Um, it was established in 1891. The port of Portland owns four marine terminals, including Oregon's only deep water draft container port and three airports. They manage five industrial parks around the area and they uh, actually operate the dredge of Oregon. Not the, you know, like, not the drudge, but the dredge. <laughs> the dredge of Oregon to help maintain the navigation channels. They're located on the lower Columbia and Willamette rivers. So here's a, here's a map of what Portland, the port of Portland looks like. The overview shows the position of the three terminals, T4, 5, and 6, on the rivers around Portland. They are both served by uh, BNSF and Union Pacific Rail. It's actually 78 nautical miles from the port of Astoria. And about 10 knots per hour, it'll take eight hours to reach the port from the ocean. If you look in terms of shipping efficiency, this is most of their um, cargo now is automobiles coming from mostly Japan. So if you looked at, Japan is about 4,800 4, miles away. In nautical miles, it's about 5,300 miles. And so going 10 knots per hour, it would take 22 days to get to Portland. So that's just kind of a little overview. Now looking at cargo by terminal, the Port of Portland has had a couple major setbacks since it signed a 25-year lease in 2010, primarily to ship containers at Port, uh, Terminal 6 and to become the sole shipping container terminal in Oregon. So they ran into some problems with safety code violations, increased costs and labor relation problems, by uh, specifically one sh shipper, they ceased operations and that triggered a second shipping company to pull out. Both ceased operations March 2015. Anybody here from Longshoreman? Is that about true, guys? It's open again. Okay. To replace uh, connections to Idaho, the port began a barge service for legumes going from Lewiston to the port in December. The third and final container service uh, ceased May 2016. So there haven't been um, containers, call, vessels called upon that port terminal since then. But you said they've established that? Okay. So the average, let me go to the next page. So the average, if that was kind of interesting that on their website they actually had um, average times for destinations, and I thought that was pretty relevant for Humboldt County. So looking at the average time from Portland to interior destinations, assuming freight is rolling 24-7, Chicago and Minneapolis is three and a half to five and a half days. 
Detroit, four and a half to six and a half days. Kansas City, all the way down in here by St. Louis, is six to seven days, and New York is six and a half to seven and a half days. So look at where Humboldt Bay is. It's kind of right under, right, is that where us is right there? And having a rail line going straight across, this Feather River, there's a Feather River line going through Salt Lake and to Kansas City, we're closer than Portland. So having an efficient, uncongested, modern freight system in Humboldt Bay could move goods faster and I believe cheaper. So let's, let's look at the cargo volumes of Portland. In 2014, total tonnage was nearly 13 million tons. It dropped off, obviously, with the container companies left, but they've done an excellent job in 2017, which is the latest information the website had. The port was within 11% of their former tonnage. Um, so at that particular time, without containers or break bulk, grain exports were down, um, and the volume of autos was up slightly. What really made that port um, make its projections really was the mineral break bulk, specifically potash. And that really drove the volume. So potash is not uh, mined and manufactured salt that contains potassium, used in manufacturing and various types of fertilizer. So it's interesting to note the dredge spoils of 2.8 million. So cubic yards, that's pretty impressive that they the dredge of Oregon is very proactive in keeping those channels open for their ships. So what is happening with Portland? Obviously, Terminal 6 is a major focus. They want to bring that container business back. Um, in 2016, that terminal landed 167,000 automobiles. Uh, this map shows how the five bursts, as you can see obviously along the waterfront, and uh, 419 acres of upland is organized. Altogether it's about 3,700 feet of bursts space, space. <laughs> tongue tied for sure, and the depths are 43, 40, and 37 at the docks. So pretty close to what's happening in Humboldt County. The intermodal yard, which is the rail configuration, is 52 acres with eight multi-use tracks. They have 125 acres for containers and are really working aggressively in, in regaining that, that business. Two berths are used for auto and the three others are multi-purpose and containers. They have seven cranes and four are post Panama to handle those large ships. So, you know, they've had some setbacks but they've also been working hard to be a viable port uh, for the West Coast. So let's look at the Port of Oakland. Since uh, 1927, the seaport, Oakland Seaport has served as a principal gateway for international cargo container shipping in Northern California. They, have 30, they oversee 1,300 acres of maritime related facilities, serving a local market of over 14.5 million consumers. 34 within the seven hour drive and 50% of the U.S. population is accessed from their port on rail. It's pretty impressive. The port has three container terminals, two intermodal rail facilities, and it's served by UP and BNSF on the waterfront. All shipping channels and 90% of the berths at the port are dredged to 50 feet. The depths capable of accommodating vessels with 18,000 containers, and the railroad facilities are located adjacent to the main terminals. So let's look at the map. So it's, you have to really come up here closely to look at it. It's amazing when you look at what they've been able to accomplish since 1927. So the port is located on the east and central location of San Francisco Bay and surrounded by the city of Oakland and Alameda. It has 31 bursts. That is pretty impressive. At, the, at depths of between 37 and 50 feet. Most are fully operational. There are a couple that are for lease. 
They have their rail yard, their two rail yards encompass about, which is down in this area, about 200 acres in the green area. Um, many of the cranes are post -Pan Panama to handle those large ships, like that container ship of 18,000. The port of Oakland, it's sea, land, and air. Together, it supports over 84,000 jobs in the Bay Area, and 20% of those jobs are Oakland-based. They just released an economic impact study in April, so it's definitely a worth see to Google that and um, take a good look at it. The overall economic value from business revenue, consumer spending, and total value of goods and services tops $130 billion. Port and tenants also contribute about nearly $700 million in state and local taxes. That would be nice. <coughs> Port of Oakland uh, loads and discharges more than 99% of the containerized goods moving through Northern California. Based on 2017 data, Oakland's cargo volume makes it the eighth busiest port in the United States. San Francisco ranks third are the top three in the Pacific Gateways for cargo, containerized, containerized cargo. So that looks like LA, LA Long Beach, San Francisco, um, to the south, Tacoma, and Seattle to the north, and the Bay Area in the middle. In 2018, about 78% of Oakland's trade was with Asia, 11% Europe, 4% in other countries, and 7% lands and stays domestically in that area and in Hawaii. California's three major container ports carry 50% of the nation's total container, container cargo. So that's pretty impressive when you think about those three ports uh, handle that much volume. So let's just kind of look at what that volume is. How many containers? So in um, 2017, it was 2.4 million. 2018 was 2.5 million. So a TEU, for those of you who don't know, stands for a 20-foot equivalent unit, which can be used to measure a ship's cargo carrying capacity. The dimensions of one TEU is like a standardized at 20 feet, but it's also uh, 8 feet tall. Most of the port's cargo is containers in Oakland. They do have some rolling stock like vehicles and equipment and some great bulk, but containers is the name of the game for them. It's interesting to note that 25%, roughly, a little more, a little less, of the containers are shipped empty. So uh, last year alone, nearly 700,000 empty containers were paid to go somewhere. So that in itself, it's, they're not always full. But if you're at Longshoreman, you know that. So. Port of Oakland, what are they doing? How are they positioning themselves for the future? So Oakland's cargo volume, they want it to be about 2.6 million by 2022. And as you saw, they're well on their way to doing that. They're planning for growth. The port plans two capital projects, a 280,000 280, square foot refrigerated distribution center called Cool Port Oakland is opening this summer. And another, and I don't know if we would actually need a cool port in Humboldt County, right? We just open, you know, use natural air. Another 440,000 square foot distribution center. But the centerpiece of their strategic plan is curbing diesel emissions. And the port commits to an overall reduction by 2020 of 85%, which to me seems amazing. Are they just going to go to all electric vehicles or how are they going to accomplish that? Um, the Port of Oakland just announced a new digital collaboration shipping platform to speed up global trade flows. So the, this online portal provides a range of logistics from tracking to transporting containerized cargo. The move aligns with the industry migration towards digitization, digitization. <laughs> you know what I mean of international supply chains for efficiency. And that's really, I mean, it's all about efficiency because time is money. 
So let's take a look at Coos Bay. Believe it or not, Coos Bay has nine terminals. It's actually called the Oregon International Port of Coos Bay. It sounds like they named our airport. <laughs> it's the largest deep water draft coastal harbor between San Francisco and Puget Sound. I don't like that. Where's Humboldt on that, right? They don't consider Humboldt County is a port worth reckoning with. And is Oregon's second busiest port besides uh, Portland. The port operates a 130-mile Coos Bay Rail Link, which connects the port to Eugene and the National's Rail Service. In the mid-1990s, the port of Coos Bay held the title of the world's largest lumber shipping port. Lumber ships loaded with whole logs of dug fir, western hemlock, and Oregon for Orford Cedar were common sites on the dock. Very, very similar to Humboldt County, right? Let's look at what their harbor configuration is. If I can get to my next page. So this shows where all the um, terminals are located. The port serves international and domestic trade. The major export is wood products. That's no surprise there. The port has over 22 acres of land is centrally located on the west coast and promotes itself as having a full multimodal transportation system with our 134 mile class one rail link to Eugene. It's located on 101 so we have easy access north and south as well as there's three highways that will take you to Heights um, Interstate 5 and they support a regional airport. Very similar very similar. So let's look at the cargo. So in 2017, wood products was 1.8 million tons. That's what was shipped out. What came in, um, and it was hard for me to find what is imported into a port of Coos Bay. So they had a lot of seafood that was 10,000 tons, as well as the total value was 200 tons. They had 100 vessels calling on that port, and 70% of all wood products shipped from Oregon go through Coos Bay. So they really have um, branded themselves as a timber port. So they have six marine terminals, uh, seven deep draft berths, along with several barge facilities, and it's served by a foreign trade zone and an airplane zone. So for those of you who don't know what a fee FTZ is, it's a duty fee, fee duty-free designation so you can defer, eliminate, or reduce duties on imported goods. So that is a competitive advantage. It's also an enterprise zone which exempts businesses from local taxes on new investments for three to five years, but as long as 15. So it's a good place to do investments and they are definitely poised for growth. Uh, wood products continue to dominate exports. We looked at uh, 1.8 million of tons of logs of logs and pulp. Um, just to let you know, the railroad hauled $220 million in wood products to the interior, and the railroad supports 1,000 people over three counties, and um, it employs about 2,200 people in the, t in the timber industry in Coos County alone. So rail in, in Coos Bay has been problematic, so let's take a look at that. So the history of Coos Bay, the port of Coos Bay, so if we go back to this map here, this north jetty was completed in 1901 to provide a safer entrance. Since the 1890s, railroads have been part of the, the port, but it wasn't until 1916, the port had no rail connection to the interior part of the state. In 1908, the port was formally organized and a year later it was ratified by the state. So remember, while they had, didn't have a rail line, it would be another seven years before it connected to the state's interior, and that was by Southern Pacific. Last year, the port assumed operations of the Coos Bay rail line. So they're, they're, they're assuming operations of a 100-year-old rail. And the technology and engineering that was from 100 years ago 
So very similar to Humboldt County. So it owns and operates and maintains the line with its nine tunnels and 38 bridges. And Dan, I won't put you on a spot to quiz you on NCRA, but uh, it's pretty typical for a rail line. So um, developments on Coos Bay. What are they investing in? Um, years ago, there was a liquid natural gas facility that was looking at Humboldt Bay, and we didn't want that for our community, so they went to Coos Bay. So they're going to be serving the overseas markets on the Pacific Rim. The natural gas will be delivered to the terminal by a pipeline in Southern Oregon. It will produce 7.8 million tons, making dredging a, a severe priority for Coos Bay to allow the 70 additional vessel calls. The contribution to the economy is providing 6,000 jobs for construction. So Jeff, I hope your, your union people are a part of that project. And 200 family wage permanent jobs once it's completed. They're also going to do a brand new, if you look on this, you can see the ocean, you can see a sand spit, you can see the bay or the harbor, and you can see raw land that they are in um, the pre-planning stages of, but they want it to be served with rail infrastructure. The primary focus is designing structures for this terminal capable of handling a host of commodities, such as aggregates, hmm, sounds similar, agricultural products, we do have some of that, machinery and containers for global markets. The port views the project as a gateway to serve the needs of the nation with adaptable, modern, and solid infrastructure. So I'm sorry to throw numbers at you, but it's, it's significant. Looking, it's interesting to look at the budget for Coos Bay because we're really similar in terms of economy and configuration. Coos Bay had 100 vessel calls and this maritime activity does affect their financials. Humboldt Bay is a harbor, recreation, and conservation district. Without the harbor's active participation in its budget, it's hard to do the recreation and conservation without being funded by grants. The Port of Humboldt's budget comes primarily from property tax, grants, Woodley Island Marina, but the big difference is the number of vessels. Out of the nearly $5 million budget, for revenues, $100,000 is projected for port activities on our harbor. That's roughly from a dozen ships. Obviously, it's a lost opportunity when a port is not served by rail. Uh, please show me a port that does international commerce, that doesn't have a rail, because I'd like to know I haven't found one yet. So, Port of Humboldt, let's bring it back home. What are the goals for this year? The goals for the Port of Humboldt feature many of the ongoing goals and there is being, there's new development being looked at. So we talk about dredging as an ongoing um, goal. Marketing for cruise ships is an ongoing goal. A port marketing strategy is an ongoing goal. And in various marketing, I mean management studies are an ongoing goal, but look at the pre pre-planning for the port offshore wind, uh, the fishery needs, and as well as a, a modern multi-purpose berth. They're talking about wind energy for actually two projects. One is offshore and one is onshore by the Eel River. There's talk about a fishery production farm and hopefully next month we'll have them come and present because that sounds like a pretty exciting project. What the Port of Humboldt doesn't have that every other port needs is a rail line connecting to a national rail service. Our region and our economy have languished for over, languished for over two decades without adequate transportation by air, rail, and road. The freight, a freight corridor can put the Port of Humboldt on the Pacific Rim and be a gateway to the U.S. And it's interesting for me that all these ports look at themselves as a gateway to the Pacific Rim and to the interiors of the United States except for Humboldt Bay. Now when you look at Coos Bay, and I've actually been up there, and who's been up there recently? 
It's, an, it's a beautiful port, but when you look at our bay, our bay has way more to offer. We have so much land that has been developed in our history that is waiting to be utilized. That's not the same thing as what's happening up in Cruz Bay, and I just feel that we have a bigger, brighter, um, more robust asset here at Humboldt Bay than other ports of similar size. So I open it up to your questions or comments, and, and thank you for letting me present. Yeah, Portland didn't have that information on the website. I could probably figure that out just by the distance from the ocean, maybe 100 miles, maybe less than that. But when you go about 10 knots an hour, you can kind of figure out the map. Part of Oakland's problem is that the ships wait to get their birth space. The intermodal, the new digital system that they're going to have is they actually, if you go to the port of Oakland and you look at their logistics page, they actually have ships that have to dock at a certain time and be gone at a certain time. So they're really trying to get them through there. I don't know how, you know, like an airline, how on time they are. So that's a big question. At least have the information on the website. Are the, yes. wait, are the wait times at, Port, uh, at uh, Oakland? Shorter than those down in Long Beach, Los Angeles area. Do you have any idea if, if it's less crowded there? Is what I'm wondering is, is Oakland in fact less congested than Southern California? That information exists, but I think that that is something that is an industry secret. <laughs> I haven't found any information yet. I mean, that's part of my ongoing quest. But yeah, I don't have that. Yes. Um, this is the roundabout piece of information that's good for the West Coast and maybe down the road good for Eureka. We just did a Panama Canal cruise and we one of the pieces of information that we came from, we were in the midship and to go through the Panama Canal it cost our Royal Caribbean ship four hundred thousand dollars to go through. Uh, the big ships um, like the Norwegian and that was eight hundred thousand and that doesn't even count the cargo. So we were told that um, China is now looking to come to the West Coast and even though it takes more time, rail it to where they need to go because it's cheaper than going through the Panama Canal. There definitely is um, some barriers happening right now because a lot of, you know, if you look at uh, Savannah, Georgia, Mobile, Alabama, Fort Smith and Virginia ports, they've all geared up for the expansion or the widening of uh, Panama Canal, and they're doing a tremendous amount of volume, partly because the congestion of the West Coast is so significant. There's actually businesses and, uh, who are shipping their stuff to Houston to get out to the Pacific Rim. So there's an opportunity for us along the West Coast that, for certainly for Coos Bay, for Portland, and certainly for Humboldt County, to ease that congestion because it's all about speed and the time efficiency and the savings that come with that. I still think the, the East Coast ports have a tremendous amount of volume. Europe is a huge market. But if we're sitting on the Pacific Rim and we're not engaged in international trade, shame on us. Yes, Scott. Yeah, I, uh, I heard that uh, in Coos Bay, the, the largest um, company up there just closed. I think they're selling, uh, they're selling a lot. It's either GP or LP. And they just, they closed. They said they can't get enough uh, timber out of Oregon now. Well, there is Georgia partly Pacific. Partly because of fires and partly because of restrictions on logging. They so you think shut Georgia down. Pacific? Yeah, I think it's GP. Yeah, interesting. They just shut down and they laid off Oh, I don't know. A whole bunch of work. That's a shame. <laughs> Let me take someone else. Anyone else have it? Yes, sir? I can just speak from my past experience. I was in the seafood business for 28 years, and we operated a facility here in Eureka Pacific Choice, and we also had one in Charleston, Oregon, which is the port uh -huh. of Coos Bay. And 
several huge differences. Let's say we were unloading albacore. Can you hear him okay? You want the mic? Let's say we were unloading albacore and we're shipping it into Mayaquist, Puerto Rico to Bumblebee. We we're unloading West Coast frozen albacore shipping into Mayaquist. With the advantage of Oregon is, is, number one, you have rail, but the big advantage is, let's say that the tuna boats are a thousand miles offshore, we would direct them into Coos Bay in versus Eureka, because the traveling time is, is relatively the same if you're that far offshore the way the globe goes. When you get into Eureka, you have high fuel costs, much higher than getting uh, vessel fuel in Coos Bay. Also, you have road restrictions. In California, road restrictions, we would bring containers up from Oakland. We would load 40,000 pounds in a container here, truck it to Oakland, put it on a rail car in Oakland, ship it, rail it to New Orleans to bypass the Panama Canal, and then put it on a ship in New Orleans to go to Maya West Puerto Rico. You can only on the highway in California, you're subject to 80,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So 40,000 pounds of fish, plus the container, plus the trailer, plus the tractor. All we could put was 40,000. In Coos Bay, we could load 50,000. So let's say you have 20% more, so your freight cost is reduced by 20%. We would truck it from Coos Bay into Tacoma and ship it out of Tacoma. But Oregon has different weight restrictions for inland freight. There's a lot of different advantages that California is suffering. The biggest problem also in, in here, you have no way to get out of here. Mm -hmm. So containers coming in, inbound containers, although you're subject to 40,000 pounds when you put that container on the road, you could load it with 80,000 pounds on the ship. Well, where do you break it down? The container gets here, you can't move it. Coos Bay, you could put it on, you could bring in a container heavy, put it on a rail car, on a flatbed, and your freight cost is cut in half. So there's, there's so many disadvantages while there's advantages. In a rail car, let's say you're shipping 40 to 50,000 pounds in a container, a rail car, you can load 104,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So your carbon footprint is cut by two thirds. And you, if you put the container on a rail car, you're putting it on a flatbed. But if you load the rail car, you're at 104,000 pounds. So you're virtually two and a half, almost three containers worth can go in a rail car. Uh, years ago, when we had the rail spur here, we were canning tuna in the Eureka plant here for King Neptune out of Puerto Rico, <coughs> we would ship 104,000 pounds of canned tuna right next to the Pacific Choice plant. There was a little, yeah. we, we'd bring the rail car there and we'd forklift the cans over. We could put 104,000 pounds of canned tuna and ship it all the way to New York. You know, it saved, just huge savings. But without rail, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. That's right, and so without there are. Rail, we're there are people who are putting together uh, it's Humboldt Eastern Railroad um, looking at a 220 mile rail from Humboldt Bay to Gerber Red Bluff area. Um, they're raising the seed money for uh, the pre-permitting. They've been invited by the Surface Transportation Board in DC to uh, develop this rail and also working, we're just now working at the state level because this is consistent with the state rail plan and the goals and strategies for the state of California because they recognize the congestion in Long Beach and LA and San Francisco and Oakland is driving business away and to have uh, unutilized asset here waiting to be developed is definitely got GoBiz interested in what's happening here. But you're absolutely right. Big heavy things go on rail. And it's interesting the way that the port of Oakland is configured, they don't really have rail on dock. They have to uh, intermodal shuttle it to the rail lines, and that in itself is inefficient. So it's interesting how markets change and technology changes over 100 years. 
that if you can design the perfect harbor and terminals now, what a wonderful opportunity that is to compete in today's market. So that's. I, I do know in Oakland they have ordinance all around the port. We are not subject to the 80,000 pound weight limit. For, for instance, if you're on the highway, you're 80,000 truck trailer and everything, but around the port of Oakland, you can, you can drive around the, the trailer that weighs 150,000 pounds and, and not get fined. They have, they... Yeah, because they have these orange lines here, or the heavy, the heavy freight lines that you can drive around and move things and get them on and off and stuff, so it's pretty cool. They've planned that out, but they're pretty much landlocked. And they do want to expand, and I wholeheartedly think they have capacity too, but it really comes down to those wait times. So uh, I don't know that they could do 3 million containers in a year because they just the congestion problems they're facing now is just uh, dramatic. It'll be interesting to see. But let's pick up that volume. Any other questions? Yes, David. I'd like to ask, is there anybody here from the Harbor District? I think that's a big problem we had as political. Ten years ago, they were told us we had a problem with the jetties deteriorating, deteriorating out here in the North Spit. And to a certain extent, the South Spit, and if those jetties aren't maintained, pretty soon we won't have anything but a lagoon. They were told, and now you take a drive out there, and it's pretty much uh, gone. It's going to take billions of dollars if, if there's a will to rebuild those jetties. So, so the fact that I don't see any harbor district representatives here kind of points to the problem. We're sitting on a golden opportunity that the United States doesn't have, and yet we can't get the political will to get the railroad from here to Red Club. So until we can change the political climate and get politicians that work for us instead of no growth, I don't know what we can do. But thank you for your presentation. I think you bring out some excellent points. Well, the um, Service Transportation Board in D.C. and Go Biz of Sacramento is very excited about this project. But it really comes down to, do we have the political will? Do we have the local desire to, to, to say this is what we want for our community and make it happen? So that money, <coughs> when you look at the taxes that would be generated for the harbor and all the fees and for our surrounding communities, we could do our dredging more consistently on time and our levees around the bay could be fixed. We could plan for sea level rise and we can actually afford to do a lot of recreation and conservation, but we just don't have the money to do that. That's where the commerce comes in and I wholeheartedly agree. Thank you, Sid. And thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you very much. Can you summarize what, what Coos Bay has that we don't? What Coos Bay has is they have the ear of the Army Corps of Engineers because they're doing a major dredging project right now on their harbor to get ready for the LNG plant. So what Coos Bay has that we don't, they have a rail and then they have a major dredging project going on right now. And we don't. I wish we did. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.